Jim Doyle, thank you for actually joining me. You're most welcome. Yeah, appreciate your time, and it's good to be here at the uh, Vodafone Warriors. Yeah, yeah, no, it's actually good. I've been here just over six months, and it's uh, good to take on a challenge. It's something that means so much to most New Zealanders. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. Um, UMFA is all about inspiring people to achieve extraordinary things. So, who and what during your life and career has inspired you? Oh, I think I've been quite lucky. I, I, over the years, you know, coming, moving countries, you know, leaving Scotland, I went to South Africa. Leaving South Africa, I came to New Zealand and I've gone and worked in Australia. Uh, I've worked for quite a lot of different companies and that for me was one thing that I made a decision quite early. Um, I started off life as an, as an apprentice electrician. Uh, one thing I learned very early in life, what I realized was that there has to be somewhere better to live than Scotland. And I went to South Africa and then very quickly again, I thought I want to get off the tools and continuously grow. So I remember going to, when I was at university and I had a couple of different lecturers and um, one lecturer had had like 10 jobs, you know, he'd worked in the electrical industry, the technology, the meat industry, the farming industry, the sports industry. And every time he spoke, he had so much different knowledge. Whereas the other person who was a lecturer had been with the same company for 25 years. Right. And I thought he's got like one year's experience 25 times, whereas yeah. the other guy had 25 years real experience because he had changed. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, I want to be like him. Okay. So I spent a lot of time actually, you know, every year or two moving from one job to another to try and learn as much as I could. And I had a few really good managers and sort of CEOs of companies that were very knowledgeable and they helped me, you know, learn lots of things. Yeah, yeah. And back when you were in Scotland as, a, as an um, electrician's apprentice, did you ever see yourself getting into business and sport? Was that something that was on the radar? No, the not really. I wanted to, to progress. You know, one of the things I thought most of my friends, most of my family, most of my friends' families were all working class, you know, they were tradespeople or, or that type of thing. Um, and I thought, well, I, I'd actually like to progress to try and do something a bit better. I'd like to go to university, I'd like to get a better education, I'd like to get a better job. Largely, for most people, including myself, you concept of the better job you've got, the more money you can make, the better lifestyle yeah. you've got. Yeah. And I wanted to try and, and, and achieve as good a lifestyle as I could, really. Yeah, yeah. So, so back when you were a youngster back in Scotland, if someone sort of said to you, Jim, you know, one day you're gonna be part of this half a billion dollar technology company and, and second in charge of one of the biggest sport competitions in the world and CEO of a massive sports team. I mean, would have, would have that been a surprise at that stage? Oh, completely. I would never have believed <laughs> them. I'd have said you, that, that, would not, that would not happen in my wildest dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you gotta remember that as well. You gotta always, remember where you've come from yeah because a lot of people sort of just I some, sometimes think they get a little bit carried away yeah. you know I remember uh, when I was in South Africa and I had an interview uh, with my with the CEO it was actually my performance appraisal salary review type sort of thing yeah and he asked me how much would you like to earn and I said to him well I'd actually like to earn what you earn and he says well it wouldn't make any difference because you would just spend it anyway and I said no ways I'd save a fortune if I earned what you earned he said, no, you would just get a better house, a better car, you'd buy better clothes, and you would just live differently. Okay. And I said, yeah. no, but he's, they're right. Yeah. Most of the time, <laughs> yeah, you just yeah. sort of step up. So it's important to uh, remember where you come from and keep that right balance. Yeah, and after South Africa, why, why New Zealand? What, what did you Oh, uh, in those days, you know, for me, South Africa, and, and going back, you know, when I went there, sort of late 70s, early 80s, mm. it was the land of opportunity. Okay. Um, and, and violence was getting more and more and more. You know, my wife and I are both from the UK. My daughters were both born in South Africa. Um, but as the violence was getting more and more, we decided that we didn't want to live there. Yeah. And we didn't want to grow old there. And we didn't want our kids to grow up there. So we thought, let's go back. None of the two of us wanted to go back to the UK. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it was mainly in you know, Australia and New Zealand type sort of thing. Okay. And in those days, um, go back, you know, it was the early 90s. Yeah. Um, we thought that New Zealand had a better economy. Education for children was perceived to be better here. Yeah. Um, so we thought, let's go to New Zealand. It's uh, what most Scottish people tend to do anyway. <laughs> English people go to Australia, Scots come to New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. So we thought, let's go there. Awesome. And then you got here, it's 1994, you were 34 years old and you were working with a, was it a car, car stereo business? Is yeah, the first, the first job I got when I came um, was a company called Alpine, yep. Alpine Car Audio. So we supplied car audio to the car industry, obviously the retail side, yeah, but yeah. also to Honda and Toyota and that type of thing in their factories. Okay. So that was my first sort of job. Yeah, yeah. and then you met Sir Peter Mayer and Navman in 1997. So how did that come about? Yeah, well, Pete, I wasn't Sir Peter Mayer then, yeah. it was just Peter Mayer. And um, I I'd, I'd got to know him a little bit through the technology you know, industry because it was relatively small. And I was lucky, I was actually sitting in my office at, at Alpine and I got a phone call from a headhunter. 
and uh, it was a woman and she said to me, oh, Peter Mayer, um, the company was called Talon Technology in those days. Um, Pete's interested in employing sort of a general manager. Yep. Um, you, um, your name's come up, uh, is it something you'd be interested in? Yeah, yeah. So I said, yeah, that would be, and I put the phone down, then I phoned Pete, and then I went to see him the next day, and uh, it progressed from there, really. They offered me the job, and uh, I started the Navman. So. Yeah, and at this stage, did you know much about technology, or was it more the start of your te technology career? No, I'd such? always been sort of involved in technology, Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and for a long time, and um, and I had done a bit of management. I'd worked for various big companies overseas and things. Yep. So it certainly wasn't foreign for me whatsoever. Yeah, uh, it was yeah. certainly, um, it was a step for me. One of the key things was I got some equity in the business as part of that, got some shares. Yep. Previously, I'd, 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 I'd always classified myself as a hard worker, yeah, yeah. Um, but previously I just worked for other people. Got, yeah, got a salary, yeah. but worked for other people, where that was an opportunity to, in some aspects, work for myself as yeah, well. Yeah, so that yeah. was a big driver for me. Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, we went from a small little marine company uh, doing three million dollars a year to obviously a, a much larger company doing all sorts of different technology. Yeah, um, five hundred million a year. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's an amazing story. So, what well, from what was it like being involved in the? I mean, that growth from as you say three million to five hundred million. I mean, that's huge growth. So, what was it like? What were some of the lessons you learned? Yeah, from a, like a huge, huge amount of lessons. I mean, it was it, it was massive growth. I think we were the fastest growing company in the world, not just in New Zealand. Wow. Um, but like most things, it comes down to the people. Yeah. You know, we had, there was, a, there was three, there was a team of three, I mean, obviously, uh, Sir Peter obviously started the organization, yeah. um, but they also had another guy there called Stephen Newman, okay. and then myself, when I joined, we sort of, you know, completed each other, therefore, yeah, between the yeah. three of us, we had all the skills, yeah. you know, whether that be entrepreneurial skills, whether it be good financial engineering skills, yeah. good people skills, and all that type of thing, so we ended up, you know, being a really sort of strong team. And we had we had a vision to grow the organisation. We had different strategies that we wanted to grow into different areas and things. Mm. Um, but again, another attribute was that we worked really hard, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you get nothing for nothing. So yeah. it was. I mean, we, we made lots of mistakes along the way, yeah. um, and but we obviously got a lot of success along the way as well. And it was great to see a lot of people come with us on that sort of journey. Yeah, and down here in New Zealand, was it hard finding the right talent to you know? develop this technology. Yeah, it was. And, and yeah. one of the things, you know, when we were called Talon Technology, a little company that hardly anyone had ever heard of, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, at times we, we made conscious decisions that we, we wanted to stay below the radar. Mm -hmm. Let's not tell people about us at all. Yeah, Let's yeah. just keep doing what we're doing. Let's keep growing because the bigger you are, other people see that and want to sort of knock you down type sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so we just kept going and going, but at some point when we were looking for more and more people and we were advertising in the newspaper, we wouldn't get many applicants because people mm -hmm. never heard of us. People okay. were like, you know, there's a job in the newspaper for a company called Talon Technology, yeah, yeah. never heard of them. Yeah, yeah. So what we then said is that we need to start raising our own profile, okay. not because we want to raise our own profile, but because we need people to know about us yeah, so yeah, that yeah. we can get them to join us. We, yeah, yeah. So we went to universities, we started talking to them about what we were doing to try and attract the best students to come and work for us. And we started to then get some external PR out in the media so that people became more aware of the company so that we could attract talent because getting talent is really tough. Yeah, you know? yeah. And we, we, we targeted, you know, we'd go at some points, we'd go to the UK and target people to come and work for us. Uh, we went to South Africa, target people to come and work for us. You know, it was really important to not just you know, look here, but look overseas to get the best talent to help us grow. Yeah, and was most of that talent in technology, like developing stuff? Was it more in sales as well? Like oh, a combination of everything. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously, the, our company was very much a technology-driven company. So, yeah, yeah. engineers, you know, were always the hardest to get. You know, really good engineers to help develop smart, innovative products. Yeah. But the more we grew, the more we got into different industries. Therefore, we needed salespeople in different parts of the world, you know, we set up in the UK, we're up in the US. So in those places, it was largely, you know, sales and customer service type sort of roles. Yeah. Uh, whereas we did more and more engineering here. Yeah. Um, but again, as we expanded, we looked and we did more and more engineering in Asia and that everything as well. Okay, and I, mean, I can imagine as well, you must have learned a lot of the sale to, to Brunswick in 2004. So what, what did that teach you? It's such a big sale, I mean, I imagine you would have learned a lot from that as well. Yeah, definitely. Again, you know, if you, if you consider you know, as a company grows and things, one of the things that you you need to think of is what's your exit strategy. Yeah. You know, I mean, 
again everybody's got different thoughts and ideas but if you're going to work really hard for 10 years or so you want to really get something out of it at the end yeah. uh, and we looked at potentially listing on the stock exchange and we thought shall we list on the stock exchange as an organization uh, and but we thought well that's not really an exit strategy because you still have to stay there yeah. you still have to manage the business you put more pressure on the executives and if the executives want to sell their shares one day everybody out there says well why what's wrong with the company and the share price potentially yeah, yeah, goes backwards yeah. So um, we thought it would be good to make a sale, you know, if we sold the company, all the effort that we've all put in over the last 10 years or so will be all worthwhile. Um, and then going through that process, that due diligence and things with Brunswick, going through the sale process, then being part, changing from being a small, very dynamic organization, even while we'd grown, you know, but to then being part of a big U.S. corporate. Because you've out for a few years after the sale, right? Yeah, once we, once we sold, we were tied in for three years. Right. So myself myself and Stephen were tied in for three, Pete was tied in for two, yeah. and therefore we stayed as part of that organization. And our roles sort of changed. You know, my role changed um, from being just Navman to being the CEO of Brunswick New Technology, therefore yeah. looking after seven and eight different companies around the world. Wow, yeah. um, so that was an interesting dynamic as well to try and make sure that all that was all integrated. And yeah. then we started, because of Brunswick's aspirations, we started to look at acquiring other companies, you know, yeah, yeah, spend a yeah. hundred million dollar buying a company because you wanted to grow, whereas small little Navman, you never thought of those types of things when you were still growing. Yeah, yeah, and what, so from your experience in this space, I mean, what would your advice be to a young person coming out of school looking to, wanting to start a technology company or get into technology, what would you say to them? Well, I think, you know, like most things in life, uh, uh, any business, you gotta have customers. And to get success, you gotta find a product or a service that people are willing to pay for. Yeah. That's the art. If you can find a product or a service that people are willing to pay for, and whether that's a piece of hardware, whether it's a piece of software, whether it's something that you sell through a shop or something you sell online. Yeah. You know, one of the positives now is that the world is such a small place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, whereas previously, you have the best product in the world, but if no one knows about it, because you know, you're a little New Zealand company, you've got a great product, but you can't have the money to market it all over the world, mm. it makes it tough. Whereas now, you've got an opportunity um, to sell that great product anywhere through the internet and through social media and all that, all the reach that you've got. Okay. The difficulty with that is it shows everybody else. So you, yeah, you'll get so competitors so. very, very quickly. Yeah. So for me, one of the things that I've always sort of said is that, you know, have a good idea, start small, don't get too far ahead of yourself and build and build and build and, and just realize that things take time. Okay, and where do you see the biggest opportunity today in technology? Oh, I think definitely through through the whole information technology okay. through unique content right. you know I mean if if you look at selling something you know in, in the past when we were at Navman we used to sell a lot of small you know $50 products yeah. to be a hundred million dollar company you got to sell a lot of $50 products yeah. but if you can sell a thousand dollar product you don't need to sell as many yeah. so if you can get yourself up in that selling price then obviously the better it is because normally there's more margins there but nowadays, you know, even if you can sell something that you get 50 cents on every single one of them, but you can actually sell 2 million, 3 million, 5 million times sort of thing globally, um, then you can actually make just as much money. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's the, that's the opportunity that that's sort of created. Okay, and when scaling as well, is it important to, you know, I know this of Navman, you started off with boats and then you knew you could move into cars and so on later. So it's important to kind of have that bigger market that you can get into. Yeah, I think for me, for us, one of the things we always looked at, we had these four quadrants that we always considered, yeah. you know, and then the bottom left hand side was your existing products to existing customers. Okay. So that's things you're already selling to people. Yeah. The easiest way to grow a business is to actually sell more of your existing products to new customers. So you look and say, well, who else could we sell an existing product? The stuff we've already got, who else could we sell it to? Yeah. The next easiest way to grow is to sell new products, but to your existing customers. So you've got a relationship to people, yeah, yeah. you go to them and talk to them and say, well, what else did you purchase? Who else did you buy things from? And as it's something that we could supply, you know, so if you don't know, like that man was, we were a technology company, we were selling fish finders and selling instruments. When we went to those existing customers, they said, well, actually, we, all, we also buy chart plotters and all those sorts of things from other people. And we thought, well, if we make that, we can, well, we can sell it to you because we've got that relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the hardest part is that top right hand, which is new products to new customers. So products you don't even know about, 
to people you don't even know. Yeah. That's the hard part. Company, right? But if you keep yeah. going all the time and you just keep expanding new products, new customers, existing products, etc., that's the way definitely to grow the organization. Okay, and when people are building these technology companies, are there any mistakes that you see being made sort of time and time again? Oh, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, sometimes people get, you know, they get ahead of themselves. Yeah. They start to have too much cost. Um, they don't think of the customer and what the customer's looking for. Yeah. Sometimes, particularly technology companies and engineering driven, they try and design something that's so perfect from an engineering perspective that you just go round and round in circles to try and make it better and better and better. Right. Sometimes you go to say, you know what, at the moment it's not perfect, but it's good enough to get it out into the market yeah. that the customer will use and then when you come up, when you improve it, you can then do a, a, an updated version or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But you've got to get something that's fit for purpose. Okay. Because not every customer is going to be as smart as the engineer who thinks this is not quite perfect yet. Yeah. So you've got to get things going out into the market. Okay, awesome. And just before we head into our um, quick fire questions, I just want to talk a bit about your job today. You enjoying, enjoying your role with the Vodafone Warriors here? Yeah, it's a different sort of role, yeah. you know, because obviously it's very, it is, although it's sport, it's still very business oriented. Yeah. But the difference is, is you get measured weekly. You know, and yeah, um, yeah. it's based on the team's performance. You know, when, when I was involved in Avman, we had a company that was doing $500 million a year, mm. and very few people knew about it. Yeah. We've got an organization here that does sort of $25 million a year, and everybody in the country knows about it because <laughs> yeah. it's profile. People are passionate about it. You know, I, I wouldn't get any letters from anybody outside the Navman sort of circle of staff and customers yeah. and things. I wouldn't get any letters from anyone. Whereas here you get them every day. <laughs> and you get them from random people who want to tell you how to improve things at the Warriors, how the team can be better, how this yeah, player's yeah. not good, or that one's good, and yeah. that type of thing. So it's a different dynamic. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so just got a few quick fire questions to finish off. Um, Jim, in summary, what would you say would be your top three bits of advice, so uh, two or three bits of advice for, for young people wanting to get into technology in, in summary? Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously, if you want, if you've got a passion for something and you're innovative yourself, yep. and then I would try and, 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 you know, come up with a concept, a solution, find a company that's got some infrastructure yep. and talk to them because that would be the easiest step for you to take rather yeah. than take your idea and then have to set up an organization with infrastructure and all that type of thing. Yeah, awesome. And uh, what would you say for you personally is one of the best bits of advice you reckon you've ever been given? Oh, I think I think for me, I, I sort of tend to be focused on two things. Okay. Uh, the first one is if it is to be, it's up to me. Yeah. You know, no one knocks on your door and offers you all sorts of things. So you've got to work hard and, and, and you know, use your own initiative to do things. Okay. Uh, and the second thing is, is you choose your attitude. One thing in life you can choose is your attitude. And you can choose a bad one and therefore you get f***ed off and the people around you are all negative and whatever. Or you can, no matter how things are, you can still choose a positive attitude. Mm -hmm. And what would the 16 year old Jim Doyle think of who you've become today? Uh, I definitely wouldn't have thought. I mean, living in a tenement building in Scotland is, uh, you know, finishing off in school or starting off as an apprentice electrician. I would never in my wildest dreams thought I would get to be living in New Zealand, running a, you know, a, a, a rugby league team and living my passion and having done well financially. Yeah, awesome. So, so is it, from your experience now, is there a bit of advice you reckon you would give him as a, as a 16 year old, your 16 year old self? Oh, I just think the same thing. Same you thing, know, yeah, choose yeah. your attitude, yeah, yeah, make yeah. sure you stay positive and okay. you know, at the end of the day, things will happen that will be negative, but if yeah. you treat them the right way and, and just work hard and, and you know, stay focused on what you want to achieve. Awesome. And um, one of the questions we ask, and this is, uh, it can be a little bit of a strange question, but what state of mind or quality of mind do you think is best served you and your success? So people have said like curiosity or um, hunger or what? I, I think for me, one of the things that I think that have, has helped me is, is I've been a good listener. Okay. You know, to be a leader of people. Now, I, I think through my time, I, I was, I would say, first and foremost, I was a worker yeah. and I got things done. Secondly, I sort of became a manager. And, and a big part of that was because I played a lot of team sport as well because, you know, being part of a team, you know, you're managing people. I played soccer, I was in the middle of midfield and I was always sort of directing people and things. So I became naturally someone who managed sort of people even from a football sense when I was younger. So I became a worker to a manager and then over time became a leader. And a lot of that is because you got, you need, to, I think you need to have good listening skills. Is, so to be able to make people feel that they are engaged and and how things are progressing. Okay, fantastic. So to finish off, Jim, can you please look down this camera here and tell us what are your wise words for the people of New Zealand? Yeah, for me, I think my wise words would be that you know, I mean, keep things simple, 
you know, as I say, if it is to be, it's up to me. Therefore, you've got to get on and actually focus on what you want to achieve by yourself. And if things negative happen around you, well, you just have to move, keep moving forward. You see it as a, a bump in the road. Um, and again, the most important thing is choose your attitude. And if you choose a positive attitude, that tends to create a lot more positive ripple effect rather than the negative side. So those are the things for me. Good. Great story. Thank you so much. All right. Appreciate it. No worries. Cheers. Cheers.